Good morning, everyone. Okay. Welcome to the last round of this season. So this is the last round for the summer. And um, we have a great lineup of speakers this morning. So the topic um, our speakers are going to be covering is, can the declining antibiotic use explain a recently observed reversal of the asthma epidemic? So this is a very promising and exciting topic, because I think we'll be um, discussing some potential um, mechanisms of cessation in there. So our speakers are Dr. David Patrick. Um, David Patrick is an infectious disease physician and epidemiologist. He's a director in SPPH. Um, so he's a past director of SPPH. He's a professor in SPPH and um, currently the interim executive lead at ECCDC. Then next we have um, Dr. Abdullah Mamou. He is a trained epidemiologist and he um, is part of the community antimicrobial stewardship program at BCCDC. And where is, oh here, um, Dr. Um, Hin Sabihi, she's a postdoctoral fellow at UBC and she works um, as part of the child cohort study and her, um, her focus of research is on asthma and atopic disease. And last we have, um, oh, here you are. <laughs> Dr. Stuart Turby, professor of allergy and immunology in the Department of Pediatrics at UBC and he's the PI of the child cohort. So please help me welcome the speakers for today. And we will have, for those of you who are, who need to fill in the online form for the CME credit, the information is provided here and will also be again provided at the end. And we'll be leaving about 10 minutes for questions in the end. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, before starting, I wanted to say that um, this story is an interesting one, and it's, I think, uh, a good example of how uh, BC is structured in a very interesting way for uh, population health. Uh, we've got all the rich population um, data that you're well aware of, uh, but also I think the fact that between UBC, SFU, we're really one large uh, you know, health research community working on the same population. Um, I think that's um, a kind of a good thing. And even uh, within the health authority organization at Provincial Health Services Authority, um, we basically had a chronic disease epidemiologist to join Abdullah and I. We had some early observations. And I guess over the course of a year, we've had the chance to get together with Hind and Stuart and Darlene and their colleagues from uh, the child cohort. And uh, we'd like to tell you that story this morning. So there's our title. It's a little bit provocative, um, but we actually uh, would, would like to get this question out to the world because we think it's, uh, it's an important one. Um, I wanted to say a little bit about funding. The population level analyses here were made possible by the BC Ministry of Health Pharmaceutical Services branch who fund the Community Antimicrobial Stewardship Program. The child study, of course, is funded by the CIHR and by the Allergen and CE and gets additional support from some of those other people down at the bottom. There's a lot of people involved in this work and, and, and a, lo a lot of people involved in child, this is not even the whole, um, the whole list. 
the people in, who are bolded here have contributed actively to the analyses that we'll, um, we'll report. So I'm going to start off by giving you a little bit of background, and then we'll introduce um, uh, 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 Abdullah and Hind to talk about the different components of the analysis. And Stuart will bestow his wisdom um, uh, as to how this fits into the whole uh, asthma pathogenesis story. So here I am, an infectious disease physician, um, talking about asthma. Why? Because it's childhood's most prevalent um, chronic disease, and it's quite distressing for uh, for, for parents and uh, and families. Prevalence in North America is at least eight percent. Many studies talking about ten to tw uh, to twelve percent overall. But this was not always the case. Um, towards the uh, the end of the 20th century, there was a doubling of asthma incidence and ultimately prevalence. Um, in the U.S. and in the U.K. And the data over on the right-hand side here uh, are indicative of, um, of asthma trends in the United States. Yet, um, uh, I, I always like to say that, that you know, prevalence is instructive with chronic diseases, but the action is with the incidence. What's actually um, uh, going on there? Incidence does appear to be falling. We've seen a number of studies now describing a declining incidence in parts of the U.S., Canada, and the UK of asthma, particularly in children. And the data on the right here are from Kai High last year that actually showed a plummet um, in hospitalizations for asthma in children of 50%. And people have been asking, why is that taking place? Uh, obviously, um, there's a lot of us here who are familiar with the environmental triggers for asthma. Have there been favorable changes in air quality outdoors? Have there been favorable changes in smoking or indoor air quality that could explain this kind of thing. Um, the clinicians would say, oh, we've been better at pre-hospital care, so fewer people have shown up at the hospital, and so this is all on us. Um, but in recent years, there's also um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of new knowledge about the environment within, about the microbiota uh, that inhabit your gut that uh, give, give you more uh, more genetic variety than your own genome, really, in terms of, um, of what's going on inside your body. So the story of antibiotics in the infant microbiome really starts with observational studies over the last couple of decades. And the real summary there is that there, there have been observational studies, prospective cohorts, some case control studies, that sort of thing, where uh, you've got a, a relative risk of about 1.5 for asthma. Um, with a range between 1.2 and 2 in those studies um, for, for developing, uh, if, if you've been exposed to antibiotics as an infant. So that's interesting, uh, but there's lots of uh, things we'll get into in, in terms of discussing what that actually means. Uh, we saw a few years ago some early output from the child cohort um, uh, and uh, published by Dr. Ariana. Uh, where we saw that an absence of key organisms appeared to be associated with a higher risk of atopic responses in, in the children in a prospective cohort study. But the authors went a little further and they decided to take a look at that experimentally. And they reported on a study in asthma-prone mice where uh, those mice were basically, you know, not, they were provided with a microbiome either of the asthma-prone kids or that same microbiome from the asthma-prone kids with these taxa added back in. And the bottom line was that those mice were less prone to asthma when those taxa were added back into the, um, the microbiota. So what this means is not hostile to anything else you've been thinking about in terms of asthma pathogenesis. Um, you might well think that some people are born with a genetic or perhaps an epigenetic predisposition to asthma or atopic responses. But then you have life experiences, cesarean section, maternal or infant antibiotics that might either disrupt an established microbiota or cause it to fail to be uh, established as soon, as soon as possible. Then if you're missing these key taxa, you're also missing short-chain fatty acid um, elaboration, which is thought to be a pathway by which um, the uh, microbiota trains the immune system to be less atopic. And in the absence of those, you'll have a Th2 skew and a predisposition towards ATP. And this is where all of your, your environmental health stuff comes in. Pollution, pollen, mites, whatever else you may be interested in are allergens and triggers. And the idea being you're that much more prone to develop an asthma attack given the predisposition than, than you would be otherwise. 
So it's not hostile to anything else you uh, you know about asthma pathogenesis. So at the beginning of this, we raised uh, three hypotheses. One was that reduced exposure of infants under one year of age to antibiotics should be associated with a decrease in asthma incidence at population level and should also predict asthma rates by local health area after adjustment for covariates. That's the part that Abdullah will um, tell you about shortly. Then we went to our colleagues at the Children's and we said, well, if this, is, this relationship is causal, the relationship should be demonstrated at individual level, getting beyond the ecological work, within a prospective birth cohort after adjustment for covariance. And uh, Hin will talk about that one. And further, we said that exploration of changes in the gut microbiota within the cohort should support a plausible biological pathway for such an effect. And Hin will also talk about that. So without further ado, I'm, I'd like to invite Abdullah al Mamun, who's our Head of Epidemiology for the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at BCCBC. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. So my talk will be focusing on uh, hypothesis one. So uh, first, I would like to start with the methodology of, that, uh, of this study focused on uh, uh, hypothesis one. So this is a population level uh, ecological study. And um, we uh, collected the data from BC Pharmanet, which is uh, a population-based uh, database that captures the community pharmacy uh, dispension of prescriptions uh, in BC. And our focus was um, uh, prescription among less than one year of age infants. And, uh, and asthma incidence, uh, uh, we focus for uh, age groups of one to four years. And uh, we also looked at uh, six specific prescribing rates. We calculated the proportion of uh, infants less than one year exposed to one or more antibiotics. So uh, for the asthma incidence data, we collected the aggregate, aggregated asthma incidence data from chronic disease uh, registry. And uh, that uh, asthma case definition uh, followed the uh, ICD-9493 and ICD-10-J45. We also collected other environmental factors and social and uh, demographic factors. Uh, among those, one is uh, fine particulate matter, PM 2.5, and social and material deprivation in GSS. We collected all this data from Canadian Urban uh, uh, Environmental Consortium, and all this data we collected uh, as uh, uh, postal code level, and later we converted to the local health, local health area levels. So we modeled uh, expected fall in asthma incidence using population attributable risk, and as you can see, this is the uh, uh, equation that we followed to calculate the population attributable risk. Here, R is relative risk for an exposure, and P is proportion, proportion exposed. So, proportion exposed, uh, proportion of uh, children less than one year exposed to one or more anti antibiotics. So, we, we also modeled, um, built up a model uh, to, to explore the association between antibiotic prescription rate and asthma incidence. And uh, we, we took into account the local health area level. We, we put that uh, variable into our model, uh, uh, and also we conducted the multivariate cause and regression, employing a generalized linear mixed effects model. So now I'll be talking about results. As you can see, that uh, there are two figures. Number uh, uh, The first figure is A, which talks about asthma incidence among children one to four years in British Columbia during the period of 2000 to 2014, and, and uh, that figure also shows the average antibiotic prescription rate experienced by their cohort during their infancy. As you can see, that blue line actually representing the uh, prescription rate, which actually uh, declined uh, uh, from uh, 1,250 to around 500. And uh, asthma incidence, which is, which, uh, which is indicated by the red line, and uh, you can see that asthma incidence uh, fell around 26%, which is from 27.3 to 20.2 per thousand population, which actually represents 1,254 fewer cases in, in each year. And the figure B, this is the proportion of exposed um, children less than one year. And as you can see that the figure clearly uh, shows the trend that the proportion of exposed also went down <coughs> over the same period of time. So now uh, this is the population attributable risk that uh, that uh, we tried to plot and uh, and uh, tried to show in in this figure. The first and last uh, red column represents the baseline and the observed, which is uh, 2014, and the baseline is 
2000. And to calculate these, we actually uh, looked at the published literature to see the reported um, asthma incidents, uh, uh, risk of asthma incidents who were exposed to antibiotics, and we figured out that there are different relative risks uh, uh, reported in different uh, epidemiological studies ranging from 1.2 to 2, but we went beyond that point, the, beyond that relative risk, so actually we went up to relative risk of 3 and we tried to uh, predict uh, the fall in asthma incidence uh, in different, uh, when considering different RR estimates. As you can see that uh, looking at RR 1.5 and RR 2 actually gives you the uh, uh, most changes in decline in asthma incidence. And beyond that, we didn't, we didn't find or we didn't see any significant decline in asthma incidence or in population attributable risk. So uh, the multivariate Poisson regression model uh, that, we, that we build up, and uh, we, we created a forest plot for other factors associated with asthma incidence um, among age one to four years of age group. As you can see that every 10% absolute increase in prescription rate actually Associated uh, was associated with 24% increase in asthma incidence, and, um, and uh, among other covariates, particular matter 2.5, uh, material deprivation index, and social deprivation index. But material, uh, but PM 2.5 is showing that every interquartile range increase there was an association or there was an increase of 16% asthma incidence. So. Having said that, there are other alternative explanations because there are other factors playing a role uh, 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 having children asthma. And um, David will be talking about a little bit about those uh, ecological observations or uh, limitations. So many of you are sitting there saying ecological, 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 and there are lots of uh, reasons to be uh, worried about that. Um, we could have reduction in other risk factors, other confounders, domestic tobacco smoke, other things like that. Uh, that's not something we can rule out from what we've observed in the population. We can in fact have reverse causation. What if a, decline, a declining rate of asthma is resulting in fewer antibiotics being prescribed because you get a wheezy baby and, and somebody wants to give them an antibiotic? Uh, that's possible. Uh, what if you have confounding by indication? That is, you get a respiratory infection, which actually is the trigger for asthma, but that respiratory infection is the reason that somebody is given antibiotics. Um, these things can't be sorted out with ecological data, uh, which is why I'm turning the mic over to Hind. Thank you very much, David. And hello everyone, I'm so glad to see such a nice turnout this morning. So, um, excuse my voice, I'm coming out of a bit of a rough week, but um, I'm very pleased to introduce the child study. And building on what we have learned from um, the BCCDC with their ecological work, we found this possible synergy that we have with the child study because we have a prospective birth cohort and we follow up with children. And the trial study really relies on this caveat that the critical developmental processes in early life determine long-term health of them. And so if you follow mothers during pregnancy and their babies in the first years of life, we can learn how genes and environment intervene in developing asthma. And then we can see if we can replicate what has been seen at the ecological level in the population level. So, let me tell you a little bit more about the child study. The child study has recruited over 3,000 mothers from the time they were, they, they, uh, they got pregnant. And what we have done was to follow up all these families in four cities in Canada. The cities are Vancouver, Edmonton, Winnipeg, and Toronto. And the child participants are, in my view, been working with this cohort for close to eight years now, are true heroes. These moms, these families, these parents, these kids have filled questionnaires after questionnaires after questionnaires. We've seen them twice during pregnancy. We've seen them at birth, three months of age, six months of age, one year of age, 18 months of age, and so on and so forth. And now they're eight, and they keep coming in for the clinical visits. So as any parent or guardian or pediatrician or any caregiver can tell you, the first, the early life 
represents a period of remarkable changes that are punctuated by the attainment of developmental you know, um, milestones. Now, many of these milestones involve readily observed physical and cognitive changes, but as important are these very these molecular changes that are imperceptible that are on a very small scale that are imperceptible to the naked eye. And these changes are the immune system and the microbiome of the gut of the baby that is training the immune system in learn and helping it learn how to interact with the environment. And so this is why when the baby is born, we have collected samples. We've collected the diapers, we have the fecal samples at three months of age and at 12 months of age. Now, what you can see is through those questionnaires that I've been uh, talking about, we also have information about their environmental exposure, pets and dogs, the age, uh, gestational age, the mode of delivery, the smoking at home, the antibiotics exposure, as well as SES, race and ethnicity. So all these gene and environmental factors were collected. And I have been involved quite intensively in also understanding the built environment, so the air pollution, the green spaces, and the, the, the exposure outside of the home. And so these kids have been seen by expert physicians in those four cities and have been um, diagnosed as age five with possible definite or no asthma. So, a little bit more, let's talk about numbers and the study sample and the microbiota subsample. So as I told you, 3,400 moms were recruited at the beginning uh, of the study. And so they were followed up, and you can see that the retention rate is absolutely um, um, steady. And so when the kids were five years of age, and they went to, um, so they were seen at three, and they were seen again at five by the expert physicians, and they have all had this very systematic way to define asthma. And what we can see is we have 2,644 moms that brought their babies at age five, and they were diagnosed with asthma or no asthma or possible. In our study, we have collapsed possible and non-asthma as the non-asthma group, so that we would only capture this very clean, definite asthma phenotype. Within this 2,644 kids, we have a total of just under 1,000 kids for which we have the stool samples that were collected at the two time points, at three months of age, roughly, and at one year of age. And you can see that the numbers at the two time points are not exactly the same because sometimes they show up and sometimes they don't. And we do our best. So very briefly, what do we do with the stool samples? What we do is we go and look at this gene, the 16S rRNA gene. This is a uh, quite conserved um, area of the bacterial, let's call it genome for now. And we developed between uh, Brett Fenley and I'd like to acknowledge Buzz Button, Button who was here with us. Um, and there, we worked very collaboratively together to develop, develop this pipeline. And this is a pipeline where what we do is we try to um, um, define the taxas, which are those, we can think about them as SNPs for the human genome, except that this is we're talking about bacteria. And we'll call them OTU, Operational Taxonomic Units. And so the pipeline reference to green genes, which is, which is a database that has bacterial OTUs. And what I would like to draw your attention to is that after all the filtering that was done and classification against the green gene databases, we end up with 174 unique OTUs. And these are the bacterial origin that we want to understand, both in terms of diversity, but also in terms of what bacteria are there and how do they interact with the environment and how, they interact, how do they associate with asthma as well as antibiotics. So about the antibiotics, uh, I'd like to recognize here the work, as David explained, this is a very collaborative process um, and a fantastic um, work that we have been doing for over the past year. 
And this is the time for me to acknowledge Fiona Brinkman and John Windsor from SFU. Hi, Tim. Um, and what they have done was to build this ontology of antibiotics. And um, what, we, what was done was to go through all these questionnaires where we asked the moms, what, what did your baby have? What type of antibiotics was given? And they were manually curated and assigned using the chemical and disease of biological interest database, and the same thing was done for antibacterial drugs. What this allowed us to do was to have an aligned antibiotic classification between the BCCDC work and our work, so that we can actually compare and try to piece this story together. So, David, David talked about the fact that when you deal with an ecological study, you don't have this individual level data. You don't know much about who took what and for what reason for each one of your participants. They have the power of the numbers. They have good numbers. 3,000 is not the full, study, full population of BC. So what we could do was to adjust for this threat of confounding by indication. So what you can see here is that when we don't account for, for when we don't pull out the kids who are given antibiotics for respiratory conditions, the odds ratio of developing asthma was over double. Okay? When we take out the kids that have confounding by indication, which means that we exclude 95 children who received antibiotics for respiratory symptom, the risk that we have falls down a bit, but we're still about double the risk, 1.9. I'd like to draw your attention here to the covariates that we have controlled for in this first layer of our investigation, the epidemiological analysis. What you can see is that we have a mixture of genetic and environmental factors. So genetics would be things like the ethnicity of the child, but the environmental factors would be your usual suspects when you think about the hygiene hypothesis, right? So things like mode of delivery, David talked briefly about the C-section and asthma association. Having older siblings, we're living in Western society where we have smaller families, and therefore kids would be less likely to be exposed to microbial, to microbial um, stimuli throughout their early childhood. The birth weight set score, the genetic component of whether a parent has any topic of manifestation, breastfeeding status, tobacco smoke exposure, air pollution as well. Here we used NO2, which is a more finely, um, uh, a more granular measure of air pollution related to traffic emissions, as well as we tried to control for some of that spatial variability, that temporal variability associated with the season of birth. I'd like to also um, talk about the fact that uh, with the help of our biostatistician staff, at Children's Hospital, Ms. Sterling Dye, she, she did this work where she asked, does the number of antibiotic courses that is given throughout the first year of life, does it matter? And here an anecdotal piece is that we have um, one child who has been given nine courses of antibiotics in that first 12 months of life. And so what we can see is from a small risk, when you don't have antibiotics of the 5%, this risk gets to 18%. And this is after removing those confounding by indication. So having three or more antibiotics in the first 12, 12 months of your life, when the baby's given that much, really, um, really makes your risk jump by 20%. <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> so, um, Let's, uh, let me take you back to the whole idea of the gut microbiome. What we know and what we have been able to um, show again is this question of what does it mean, what does the gut microbiome, how does it do um, over time? We know that the uh, alpha diversity, which is a measure of your within gut variability, we know that this is something that over time increases. And in our study, we were able to replicate this we chose two metrics, the FITS, phylogenic diversity, and CHOW1. And these metrics were chosen because they each touch on something that is very interesting for us. This one talks about the phylogeny, which is like, 
which part of the, the evolution, biology, biology evolution of the, of the gut uh, matters. And this one takes into account rare OTUs. And what we see here is the idea that when a baby is born, the alpha diversity that, that gut microbiota is, is not very diverse. And as time goes by, their diversity increases, which makes sense because as time goes by, there's diet that comes in, there's environmental factors that comes in, and so you do would expect to see this diversity increasing, which is what we see here between three months and, and one year for both um, indices. Now, how about asthma? What we see for asthma is kids who are diagnosed with asthma at age five, their diversity is decreased, right? So when you would expect the diversity to be increased at age one, the diversity at age one is decreased in kids who have been diagnosed with asthma, again, for both metrics. Let's put some numbers here. So controlling again for the same covariance that I explained earlier, what you can see is that an increase in Chow one, and this table is also seen for Fitz PD, but I'll keep it simple and just present one index. For Chow one, an increase of diversity is protective of developing asthma. And if you think about the box book that I just presented, you can see that kids who have asthma have a lower diversity. So Chow one, the more you increase, the better it is for asthma. And this is now proven with um, logistic regression, with nesting for cities, so that we would take into account um, the fact that kids come from different sites, the four cities in the child cohort. Moving to the association between microbiome and antibiotics, what happens here is not very clear. <laughs> we don't see much, okay? Whether you take antibiotics um, in the first year of life, we, there's not much going on. So next is going to this idea of number of courses, and we start to see a little bit of a trend where the more antibiotics you give, the lower your diversity. How about the timing? The timing seems to be important, where you see that that first three months of life really sets your gut microbiome um, towards dysbiosis, which is imbalance and bad training for the immune system. Um, we also see some sort of a decrease in the 9 to 12 months. But let's look at the number when you actually run regressions. So, when you run a regression, we see that in fact, prescribing antibiotic at, at any time point in the first year of life is associated with a, cre with a significant decrease in your, in your, with your alpha diversity. This decrease is shown again for the time of first antibiotic use with a very strong signal with that first three time point. But we also see it here with the last time point, the nine to 12 months. So it seems to be like you prepare your bed for dysbiosis and at the end when you get closer to that one year time point, when you get this tool, again, we see a strong signal. And the number of antibiotics again, we see a very strong association, mostly uh, with more than three antibiotics in the first, uh, first year of life. So, alpha diversity is a thing, okay? It's how your gut microbiome is composed in terms of evenness, in terms of diversity, how different it is. But what can we learn from the actual taxa, those OTUs? Because we have the 16-sRNA, what we have developed is um, this pipeline where using um, bioinformatics tools, we were able to ask how do kids who have developed asthma in the, five, in the first five years of life, how are their taxes um, overlapping with the taxa for kids who have been given antibiotics? And so what we used was, was these two um, I won't go into the details, but it's looking at um, normalizing those OTUs and looking at the relative abundances and trying to see how different they spread by phenotype and by group. And what we ask is, is there an overlap? In other words, 
are there, are there of there some bacteria that are common in kids who are given antibiotics and in kids who actually develop asthma? And the answer is yes. We found that seven OTUs, which could actually mean different bugs in, in the baby's gut, overlap in those kids who develop asthma and who are given antibiotics. And um, for disclosure reasons, I won't be talking about which bugs they are. But when we become rich, we will tell you all about it. <laughs> and so what you can see is that six out of the seven OTUs that were identified were depleted in kids who actually are given antibiotics and kids who also have asthma at age five. Whereas there's one strain or one species was over, um, um, I won't ex use the word expressed, it's not a gene, but there's, they were increased for kids with asthma and um, antibiotic use. So, causation, causation, causation. How do we explain, how do we put this into a causation model? What we did was to use a structural equation model because we have learned something about the diversity in its relation with antibiotics and asthma. We know that there are seven taxes out there that are related to antibiotics and asthma. How do we put this together? To answer is that we put the diversity measures and the seven OTUs into a latent variable, into our SEM model. And what you see here is we just did again for the same covariates that I um, presented before, um, and looked at, and we see that there is an indirect effect. So what does it mean? It means that the effect of antibiotics on asthma is through the, um, the gut, this latent variable that is measured by both diversity and the seven taxas that we, were, that we identified. And I'll give it to David to actually talk more about causation and how this three-tier study fits with the this so um, it was amazing working with Hind and Darlene and Stuart and the whole group uh, on this because they brought an awful lot um, to this. Um, I, I wanted to um, just bring it back to Epidemiology 101 though. At the beginning when we sat down with Drona Rasley and said, look, in, in asthma incidence is coming down in kids and antibiotic use is coming down in kids. Could it be causal? So short of a randomized controlled trial, which might not quite be ethical, um, we, we, we decided to invoke the spirit of uh, Sir Austin Bradford Hill, um, as if many of you will remember his criteria for causation. So if you take a look at those, strength of association, we have a strong correlation in a population-wide ecological study. We have a relative risk of nearly two in a prospective cohort study after doing our best to adjust for confounders. Uh, consistency, uh, it's consistent with the observed observational studies in the literature, but they are also these effects are consistent between the two different study designs within our collaborative. Specificity, well, it was a specific finding for asthma, but actually we should be trying to pursue this in terms of related conditions like atopic um, eczema and allergic rhinitis. Uh, temporality is a problem with the original case control studies in the literature, but cause clearly precedes effect in the prospective uh, cohort study. And even the decline in antibiotic use in the population preceded the observable decline in the incidence of asthma at ecological population level. Biological gradient, we've got a good dose response um, uh, shown here, and that reflects what we've seen in the literature and what Fauziolalgi from Pharmaceutical Sciences um, published uh, a decade ago from an observational study. Biological plausibility, this work with the microbiota was all about that. The interesting thing about these diminished taxa in line with the original study out of child is that some of them are functionally important in terms of um, the pathways that we've mentioned through short chain fatty acids and communication with the immune system. Um, the uh, coherence, uh, the findings are coherent with the published literature. Uh, experiment, there was that experiment done in mice, and obviously it would be interesting to sort of see if you could get a little bit further. People are going to ask the question, you know, could you replace antibiotics in kids, that, uh, uh, microbiota in kids that have to have antibiotics, and would that be protective against asthma subsequently? But that would obviously be a vast enterprise, uh, multi-year kind of thing. 
and in algae. Actually, if you take a look at the whole literature on microbiota right now, there's an awful lot about metabolites associated with microbiota uh, causing a lot of other things, right down to graft versus host disease and autoimmune diseases and things um, along the way. Um, so, obviously, there is the need to move on to experiment. There is a big need to see if these sorts of findings are replicated at population level elsewhere. We're planning on going back to the BC linked data to do population-wide retrospective uh, cohort study uh, to see if we can, uh, if the apparently large impact of this uh, this effect is is valid across the whole population. That's going to be really important. But short of you know doing all these experiments, the the kind of the ironic thing for us is that um, we think that uh, if, if we've done something to Im improve the incidence from a chronic disease, it's kind of embarrassing that it was sort of an accidental byproduct of something we were doing anyway, uh, which is sort of killing me. So which is why I wanted to turn this over to somebody who's been thinking about asthma for a lot longer, uh, Dr. Stuart Turvey. Um, uh, and uh, Stuart will try to contextualize all this in uh, the asthma world, and then we can take some questions. So, so I'm a pediatrician, I, I care a lot about asthma, and I think a huge challenge in, in our current clinical practice is that our treatments can control disease, inhaled steroids and other treatments. Control disease, they do nothing to prevent or, or cure disease. And so what's, I, I think, exciting and paradigm changing for us is to think about primary prevention, think about ways we might be able to intervene to actually stop this disease developing in the first place. And, and, and I think the gut microbiome offers uh, some insights and, and potentially novel ways to intervene. So the, the big outcome for us from, from this work will be to see if we can move forward on these specific organisms that we've identified, if we can move uh, forward to strategies where we would deliberately replace them, first in, in animal models, but ultimately see if we could replace them in in, um, in a clinical trial and see if that can impact um, uh, disease development. And uh, you know, while that might sound a little far-fetched, you only have to go to Whole Foods to realize how appealing this is, how many families are already using probiotics as an attempt to improve the health of, of their children. I think the problem is anyone who's read the probiotic literature will know that probiotics have really been completely ineffective for asthma, for A to B, for other allergic diseases. And, you know, frankly, that's not surprising. You know, I don't take an antidepressive medicine to fix my um, high, high blood pressure. And so it's sim similarly naive to think that any bacteria will, will fix all diseases. And the organisms that we've identified here aren't in current probiotics. They, 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 they commensals from the gut. That, that need to be developed and grown and given back specifically. So that for us is, is really the sort of wrap up big picture where we think we can go. And the final sort of, I, I think, closing comment is, is just to reflect on how fun this collaboration has been, how fantastic it's been to try and really weave three threads together, uh, the population level data, the perspective work from, from the birth cohort, and then the sort of detailed, more mechanistic microbiome work, and, and that's really brought together a huge team, and it's been fun and challenging. And one day when I give this talk, I'll be able to explain the population attributable risk that I've delivered so well explaining today. So, thank you. So at this stage, we're able to take questions, and since we are, we have people remotely online, we'll That's make right. sure that we repeat yeah. any questions. Um, and the questions can go to any of the speakers. And I also just wanted to acknowledge um, Dr. McGrail, who pulled up in the stretch limo today after landing the 81. <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice to see you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, thanks for fascinating, uh, fascinating project. Um, and you might guess what I'm going to ask, <laughs> which is, do you have any data on exposure to outdoor play? I mean, following up from Brett Finley and, uh, and Ariadne's book on let them eat dirt, you know, and the effect of that on asthma rates. Um, we have prox proxies. So we actually, um, I told you in the beginning, all these um, environmental questionnaires. 
don't know specifically how to play, but we know a lot about time activity patterns. So we know if the kid spends time in a daycare or you know facility facilities like daycares, how much time? Um, but the outdoor itself, we don't know. We know how they commute. We know if they commute by bus, by car, if they walk. Um, but not at the level at which you're looking. Yes, yes. We. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what green is. So, um, what we have done is we um, have um, tried to uh, look at the green spaces around the homes. And we have done that using different measures. Uh, we have done that at the satellite imagery, which is actually a biomass diversity, like how green is your surrounding around the home and different buffer sizes. We also have, using Google um, Street View, we know the garden, the backyard, what it's made of. So that could actually also tell us a little bit more about um, the built environment and how favorable it is for outdoor play. The other thing uh, you know, to that question is, is obviously there's a lot of interesting stuff in the observational literature. I think there's comparisons of like Mennonite, Hutterite communities. One of them has the animal husbandry way far away from the house. The other one, they're practically living with the domesticated animals. There's pretty well no asthma in the latter case uh, where, where, that, where that happens. And there have been observational studies about uh, exposure to pets in early in life. Get your kid a puppy. <laughs> uh, I will go Charlotte and then too. Um, okay, I wanted to ask about trends in breastfeeding because the microbiome is so affected by breastfeeding uh, over this period of time, as well as potential changes in maternal nutrition. You know, I mean, there's much more advice about eating more fiber, plants, that kind of thing. So, could you, uh, so could you repeat I'll, the I'll repeat the question, question which was about breastfeeding and breastfeeding trends over time, and then changes in maternal as an maternal diet. Type of. Yeah, ab absolutely, and, and I think one of the strengths of child study has been a, a very heavy focus on um, on on breastfeeding, on exclusivity of breastfeeding, on duration. Um, and I, I, I can say that the breastfeeding effect on the gut microbiome is very interesting. So, I, I, and I think it, it highlights that what we showed here isn't giving the full picture. So, uh, children who exclusively breastfeed have actually lower diversity of, of their gut microbiota. Uh, and that's a little in contrast to the data where we showed where we, I, I think, developed a theme that diverse, diversity is, is, is important and low diversity is bad. So there's, there's nuance in the diversity question, and a lower diversity from breastfeeding seems to be healthful and, and, and protective. Uh, we didn't see a strong effect in this specific study about breastfeeding and, and breastfeeding in relation to asthma, and we haven't done the work, although have the data, looking more carefully at maternal, um, maternal diet. So we don't have the answer, but we have a huge amount of data in terms of um, maternal diet during pregnancy and during breastfeeding, and for example, when um, uh, you know when the timing of introduction of solid food for those children. So, it's questions we're working on next. Um, should we take one on, uh, or two online and then get back to Tim's other thing? So the online question is for him: Families with a history of asthma or atopy may change their diet or pursue other interventions that might impact the microbiota of their children. Therefore, there is sure to be additional confounding present in the observational study. How can this be addressed? Thank you. Um, challenging and excellent question. Um, it's, um, it relates to a steward sensor in the sense that we do have this information about diet. We also have information about um, supplemental. Um, what does it call again? Supplements. Thank you. Supplements. So um, we could go back to this and grab the data, clean it, and try to control for it. What I would like to tell our um, person asking the question is that we were driven by the fact that this is a three-tier study, right? And so we are motivated to have um, confounding variables that align so that we, we're talking about, we're having the same message, we're talking about the same thing. 
know, controlling for similar covariance so that the story holds together. We have this ecological approach that we try to uh, replicate in a prospective cohort and tackling things that we cannot do at the ecological level. But those, those points are absolutely valid and correct, and they are something that we can deal with at the um, child study level. Yeah, I'm just uh, following on that, I think uh, in child, we have shown that uh, pets affect the microbiome, your cleaning products, how much uh, um, cleanliness is too much cleanliness. I'm curious if you were able to look at any differences in the rural, uh, small rural population of Manitoba compared to the urban population. And and so, uh, so just to repeat the question, were we able to look at, at, at rural versus urban populations in, in the child study work? So the answer is we didn't try yet. Uh, we do have a, a, a nice opportunity in the Manitoba site as uh, urban Winnipeggers, and then rural site at Morn Winkler. Uh, we, we, we haven't looked at our sequencing cohort is a, is a sort of smaller group, that almost 1,000 of the whole cohort. And so we haven't looked at, I'd be worried about our sample size getting very small pretty quickly, to be honest. Yes. And then just one more. Can, can I add to that, though, Tim, just before we get a bit, but, but just to let you know that you, your colleague, Megan, is at, um, from Manitoba. We've got an incoming postdoc who's going to be working towards this retrospective cohort thing in BC. She wants to do it with us in Manitoba. So we'll have the chance to sort of take a look at the individual level across the whole population if some of these effects are real. But we can't control for every confounder from the administrative data. That's the, the scale. Just, I was, were you surprised about the air pollution um, finding, you know, really no effect? Um, was I surprised? Um, is um, associated with, with the, our you know, asthma and atopic manifestation early in life. We didn't see um, a clear effect in our, um, in our modeling. This could be due to uh, a number of reasons, too. Uh, one of them is this, um, the fact that um, we have measured NO2 in the first year of life. And there's reason to believe that actually the critical time window is during pregnancy, it's prenatal mother exposure. Um, and we have some really amazing work happening right now with another collaboration with um, Dr. Michael Kobo looking at um, the role of epigenetics mechanisms with the prenatal exposure to um, air pollution. Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm David, just thinking about bugs and drugs. Um, do you have a target in mind for what antibiotic level should be yeah. in our society? Yeah. And then out of that, can we start to think about a target for something like that? Uh, so Craig is asking of, about is there a target level for, for where we should go? And it's interesting, you know, this phenomenon we, we observed, but basically, you know, we went down from 1,200 prescriptions per 1,000 kids down to more like 400. Um, so, so, so quite a dramatic drop in use. But, but, but what's the target? We really wanted to find that, but we don't define it as an absolute number because um, the goal of this whole stewardship game is that antibiotics are available for use when they're needed. And, they're, you know, we got too low. And we began to see more uh, mastoiditis because the, the the ears were left alone, you know, you know for too long, or or, or more uh, more um, scarlet fever because we weren't treating sore throats and, and and that that kind of thing. That would be a bad outcome. So what we're trying to do is to do a better job of measuring appropriateness of use to develop appropriateness targets. Um, and, you know, obviously you want a zero inappropriate prescribing. That's where you're trying to go. But we ha have to understand the incidence of our core indications and, um, and, and what appropriate prescribing is for them. So we're trying to do that work now, but the goal is obviously not just to drop things as low as possible, it's to drop them as low as possible without causing any harm. Thanks so much. Um, I was wondering what you think about the dynamic nature of these relationships, both 
both in terms of the environmental exposures like greenness and air pollution changing as children's activity spaces change, as they go from like infants spending time at home to childcare to school settings. And then also related to that finding, you have over the um, timing of antibiotic use um, and the timing of your collections. Um, so it seems like there might be a stronger relationship just based on the fact that uh, the antibiotic use is much closer to when you're looking at those people in the same place. Yeah, so there's a lot of moving parts for children in that first year or so of life. Um, and we, for, at least for child study, we, we had a protocol that we, we followed and, and captured some of, some of that, that movement. I think it's interesting to, if you look at, um, if you look more deeply in the microbiome data, it um, seems to be about timing of acquisition of the diversity. So each child follows a trajectory from low diversity at birth to normal or appropriate diversity, uh, maybe around age three. The, in terms of asthma, the mechanism we, we think is at play is actually about the gut microbiome, making metabolites, those metabolites training the immune system in this early life window, in those first few months of life almost certainly. And so, so the children seem to all acquire these organisms over time, but if they don't have them early and they're low at that three month window, we think the training of immune function is, is disrupted. So, you know, our study, we, we think that's going on. Our study wasn't designed to really answer that question, and, and the real way to do that in terms of microbiome would be much more routine sam uh, sampling to, to develop real trajectories rather than to, to static timelines. Uh, so that's what we're planning next, is the next cohort where we do it better than we, we did it the first time around. And then there was, um, there was another part to your question. First part was, if you want to repeat it for me. wonderful question and I wish um, a day was made of uh, 36 hours instead of 24 because we do have the actually some of the families have done like I told you like I I am in awe of these families um, and, and we have a good chunk of, of participants who have given us the um, addresses of the of the daycares and um, and I have done some work uh, geolocating all the all those things. I just don't have the time to um, assign exposures at all these different places. But but it's it's totally um, something that I would love to um, find the time to do because I, I believe that all these micro environments play a role. We we in epidemiology take um, in environmental epidemiology take the home as the main exposure but but um, but I also believe that taking into account microenvironments and their contribution to your overall exposome, let's throw the word out there, um, is, is, is crucial, right? To have a clear picture, to understand the contribution of different places and how they interact. Because as you said, Emily, um, you can have a very green home and then spend um, two thirds of your day in an extremely paved area. And it, I think it's good to sort of sort of finish there, sort of focusing on the idea that um, you know the antibiotics and microbiota is part of it. But you know, to, to Stuart, it was always wanting want, you know that population attributable risk thing. What are we really saying there? What Abdullah's thing showed was that if the relative risk is indeed around two, that explains some of the decline we've observed in asthma, but not all of it. So there's lots of room for everybody in helping to explain the overall trend. Um, anything uh, you guys want to say to close off, or should I say goodbye? Okay, thanks very much for attending, and see you at the next grand round.